Greetings students and welcome back to another video on quantum mechanics. In this lesson we're going to solve the time independent Schrodinger equation and determine the solution of the infinite square well. But before I get to the infinite square well let's recall three ideas we developed in the last few videos that are going to be important in this lesson. The first idea is that the time independent Schrodinger equation is an offshoot of the regular Schrodinger equation which I'll write over here. And we get that time independent Schrodinger equation when we break up the wave function psi into a function of t and a function of x via separation of variables. When we do that, the time independent Schrodinger equation then turns out to be something like this, which I'll call equation 1. Note that the constant E is a real number, as we proved in a previous video, and represents the energy of the system. Note also that we've assumed the potential V is not dependent on time, it's only dependent on location. The second idea is that the solution to the time component of the original Schrodinger equation is given by the following complex exponential. And the third idea is that if the minimum value for potential energy was greater than the constant E everywhere, then the solution small psi to the time independent Schrodinger is not normalizable. In those cases you either have a solution that increases without bound, decreases without bound, or is just trivial, zero everywhere. I didn't really discuss the zero case previously, but that's also possible since zero is still a valid solution to the Schrodinger equation. However, psi equals zero is also not normalizable. And again, by normalizable, I mean that we can make the integral of the magnitude of small psi squared equal to one. Now, although I was able to solve for the tau part of the wave function psi, I can't solve for the small psi part unless I obtain the solution of the time independent Schrodinger equation. And what's stopping me from doing that? Well, it's the value of the potential energy function. Once I specify the potential energy, I will then be able to solve equation 1 and then obtain the solution psi to the regular Schrodinger equation. In this video, I'm going to specify the potential v and compute the wave function for one important configuration, the infinite square well. And here's what my square well will look like. I've got the two walls of the well at either end. One is at x equals 0 and the other is at x equals a. Between 0 and a, so inside the well, I've got my potential set to 0. Outside the well, however, I've stepped it up to infinity. If I write v as a piecewise function, here's what it looks like. It's 0 between 0 and a, and infinity otherwise. And if I copy-paste this time-independent Schrodinger equation here, what does this mean for the small solution psi of x then? Well, intuitively, we can think of our wave function as representing the behavior of a particle. If that particle has a finite energy E, and it is required to overcome an infinite potential to get outside the well, then it's never going to be able to do that because of the finite energy. And since the particle cannot have a presence outside the well, its wave function outside the well is zero. As a result, small psi equals zero outside the well. Mathematically, another way to think about it is that outside the well, since v is infinite, the second derivative of small psi with respect to x must also be infinite, given equation 1. But we can't have the second derivative of psi with respect to x approach infinity outside the well, since that's not a physical solution. The only way to circumvent this is to have small psi equal to 0 everywhere outside the well. So now that we've established that small psi is 0 outside the well, we can move to the part inside the well. V is zero inside the well, so our equation one becomes the following. Isolating the second derivative of small psi and moving everything to one side gives us this equation. And to simplify this, we'll define a constant k as the square root of 2me over h bar. When we do that, our time-independent Schrodinger equation becomes the second derivative of small psi with respect to x plus k squared times small psi equals zero. Associated with the second order ODE, or ordinary differential equation, are two boundary conditions. But where do these boundary conditions come from? Well, we just demonstrated that small psi is zero outside the well, so right at the boundaries that separate the inside and outside, we must have the small psi equals zero. Let me illustrate this. If I draw a diagram of this well with psi of x on the y-axis and my boundaries marked as such, then I know that psi is zero outside the well. If we've got a small psi that goes all the way up here before the boundaries and then jumps to zero beyond the boundaries, then it's clearly discontinuous at the boundaries. This is a classic jump discontinuity. But we can't have psi be discontinuous and jump like this. That would be an unphysical solution. It's unphysical 
mainly because the probability flux wouldn't be continuous. A wave function that's physically sound can't be jumping around like this, even though the potential might be jumping around. Because of this continuity requirement, my boundary conditions are continuous with the small psi outside the well and hence must be zero. So now we've got a differential equation with its associated boundary conditions. Let's use this to solve for small psi of x. The differential equation we've got has the classic sine cosine solution. Just substitute e to the rx in there and you'll get complex values for r, which also correspond to sine and cosine functions. In the end, you'll find the solution for psi in terms of sine and cosine, where c1 and c2 are unknown constants found using the boundary conditions. Now let's go ahead and determine our c1 and c2. We know that when x is 0, small psi is also 0, so plugging that in leaves us c1 times sine 0, which is 0, plus c2 times cosine 0, which is 1, so therefore c2 must be 0. The other boundary condition we have to worry about is that when x equals a, psi is 0. We could say that c1 is 0, but that would just give us a trivial solution for psi, and we don't want that at all. Instead, we can use this boundary condition to find the value for k. If sine of ka must be 0, that means ka must be an integer multiple of pi, which means that k must be n pi over a. Remember from basic trigonometry that sine is always 0 for an integer multiple of pi. Now n can't just be any integer. If it were 0, then that means k would be 0, which would give me a trivial solution for small psi, which again I don't want. If it were negative, I could use the fact that we can pull out any negatives from the sine function and turn the argument of sine to a positive and kind of absorb that negative into the constant c1 that comes out front. Because of this redundancy and the fact that n can't be zero, what we'll do is restrict n to the positive integers because again, negative values of n are essentially redundant. Let's now go back to the definition of k for a moment. Remember that k is the square root of 2me over h bar, which I'm going to copy paste down here. In our other equation for k, k equals n pi over a. a is a fixed number that depends on the size of the well, but n could be any integer. And since n can take on multiple values, it's reasonable to say that k could also take on multiple values. So what we'll do is index k by the integer n. But how is this consistent with the way we defined our k according to this equation? Well, the mass of the particle is fixed, it can only take on one value. h bar is a fixed constant, Planck's constant h over 2 pi. But the energy, however, is the only remaining candidate that can take on multiple values. So what we'll do is we'll index the energy e by the integer n and get the following equation. Of course, if I solve for e sub n in terms of everything else, here's what I end up with. Now pi squared has a fixed value, h bar has a fixed value, m is fixed, and a is fixed. The only thing that's allowed to vary is the integer n. However, n isn't a continuous number, it's a positive integer, which means that e can only take on a fixed set of discrete values. So a quantum particle in an infinite square well is restricted to certain energy levels corresponding to different values of n. Energy is no longer continuous like it is in classical mechanics. Here, energy is discrete, it is quantized. That's what this equation means, and it's quite important to recognize this for quantum mechanics. Having said this, it is still possible for a wave function psi to be composed of multiple possible states with different values of n, with each state having its own energy e sub n. But that's the key. Each state has only one discrete energy level e sub n, not multiple energy levels or a continuous energy level. Anyway, we now have our small psi, given by the following equation. C1, however, is still an unknown constant. But how do we solve for it? Well, we use the normalization condition. Recall from my video on stationary states that the normalization condition for small psi is the exact same as the normalization condition for big psi of x comma t. Now this integral from negative infinity to infinity can be changed to an integral from 0 to a because everywhere else small psi is just 0. If we plug in our small psi, we end up with the integral of sine squared times c1 squared. If you use this equation to solve for c1, I invite you to show that c1 is just the square root of 2 over a. And therefore, our solution small psi of x is given by the square root of 2 over a times the sine of n pi x over a. Because I can pick any positive integer n that I want, I'll write my small psi with a subscript n to denote which value of n that small psi corresponds to. Now let's go to the side and talk about an important property of these psi n solutions. The fact that if I took my solution psi n, and if I had another solution psi sub m, 
where m was a positive integer different from n, then the integral of the product of psi sub m conjugate and psi sub n is zero if m and n are different, and one if m and n are the same. I invite you to verify this property yourself. I won't do it here because it's a bunch of computations that won't add much to your learning. But this property is special because it means that the solutions small psi are orthonormal. They're orthogonal to each other, which means that if we integrate the product of one conjugate solution with another solution that correspond to different integer values m and n, then the integral of that product will be zero. And they're also normalized, which means that the magnitude squared of a particular solution is equal to one. And that's why they're orthonormal. And this orthonormal property arises from the fact that if we go way back up to the differential equation and the boundary conditions that we originally had, we can recognize that this represents a very special boundary value problem. And do you know what it's called? Well, it's called the Sturm-Liouville problem. And if you watch my video on the Sturm-Liouville theorem, you'll see that the solutions to the Sturm-Liouville problem are orthogonal. The integral of their product is zero. And that's where this orthonormal property comes from. The other part about the Sturm-Liouville problem is that its solutions are also complete, meaning that any nice and continuous function, f of x, can be expressed as a linear combination of the psi sub n's. And this should make sense if you also know about the Fourier series. Any function, any nice enough function can be expressed as a sum of sines and cosines, which is exactly what psi sub n represents. Anyway, let's now go back to our psi sub n from before. Any value of the positive integer n would still allow my small psi to satisfy the time-independent Schrodinger equation and the associated boundary conditions and the normalization condition. As a result, there are infinitely many small psi's that satisfy our infinite square well problem. And as mentioned in my stationary states video, the best way to account for all of these small psi's in our overall solution is to express our general solution, big psi of x comma t, as an infinite sum of these small psi's times the exponential of negative i times e sub n over h bar times t. The constants capital A sub n represent the probability that the energy state we measure of the wave function is e sub n. But how do I find this A sub n? Well, recall from the stationary states video that the A sub n's are found from the initial condition. So if my initial condition for the wave function is given by capital psi of x comma zero, then I can express this initial condition in terms of my infinite series of small psi n as follows. Let's now multiply both sides by the conjugate of psi sub m, which is another indexed uh, small psi solution, and integrate both sides from zero to a. Since the integral of the sum of multiple functions is the sum of the integrals, we can switch the order of the integration and summation on the right, in which case our expression simplifies to the following. Now from the orthogonality property, the integral on the right is zero unless m and n are equal. The only time it isn't zero is when n equals m, which means that every single term in the summation will cancel out except when n equals m. This hugely simplifies things to give us a sub m equals the integral from zero to a of the conjugate of small psi sub m times big psi uh, of x comma zero. So therefore our general solution big psi of x comma t to the Schrodinger equation for the infinite square well is given by the sum from n equals one to infinity of capital A sub n times the square root of two over small a times sine of n pi x over a times the exponential of negative i times e sub n over h bar times time where n is a positive integer and the coefficient capital A sub n is given by this integral. Congratulations, you have now officially solved the Schrodinger equation for the infinite square well. In the next video, I'm gonna analyze the solution a bit further, especially with respect to the energy levels and solve some problems related to the infinite square well. I would have done that here, but I'm running out of time, so I'll stop now. I'd like to thank the following patrons for supporting me at the $5 level or higher, and if you enjoyed this video, feel free to like and subscribe. This is the Faculty of Khan signing out.